and grab your Bibles. We're continuing along with our verse-by-verse -verse, uh, Bible study in the book of 1 John. 1 John, we're going to finish up chapter 4 tonight. And as always, just as a reminder, again, I don't say these things just because I think you guys can't remember them. It's more just repetition to kind of remind us, get our minds in the right direction. And uh, we learn the best through repetition that uh, the, this letter, what it's about. Uh, and this letter, again, we said is to saved people. Uh, this epistle that's been written and uh, the theme is fellowship with God. And uh, as we go through, it goes through different things that can either harm our fellowship with God or, uh, you know, bring us into fellowship with God. And through that, we will have our joy truly full. And so tonight we're going to continue on. We left off last week in verse 13. So we'll read from verse 14 to the end of uh, chapter 4 of 1 John. Starting verse 14, it says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. And so where we pick up in verse 14, we kind of need some of the verses ahead of that to kind of continue the thought in the letter. In verse 14 it says, And we have seen and do testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And they're referencing the Apostle John uh, being one of those who witnessed Jesus Christ as he was here uh, on the earth, is pointing the fact that he was an eyewitness uh, of Jesus Christ uh, being here on the earth and that we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He's giving testimony of what they had seen of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I heard, a, a, I think it was in a Sunday school one time, a guy was preaching and he said, you know, the, still the greatest piece of evidence in our world today uh, that you could bring into a court case is an eyewitness testimony. And, you know, all throughout the scripture, we have eyewitness testimony of Jesus Christ coming into the world and, and being the Savior of the world and the, the Son of God. And here, John is giving us his eyewitness testimony. He said, we've seen it, and we're giving testimony. And, but like I said, it's kind of linked to the thought that we had earlier uh, just in this uh, same chapter in verse 13. Or I'm sorry, in verse uh, 15, let's go to verse 12. It says, no man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. You know, no man has seen God. When it says no man has seen God at any time, he's talking about God the Father, as we talked about last week. No man has seen God the Father at any time, but men have seen God the Son. Men have seen the Son of God, uh, Jesus Christ. And in John 1, it says also that no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. You know, Jesus Christ is the manifestation of God in flesh. Uh, he declared himself to be the Son of God, it says in Romans 1, by the resurrection from the dead. Uh, I believe also we have declaration of him through the miracles that he did and through the word that he spoke. And you know, in verse 14 it says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You know, and uh, we have all believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and know God through the testimony that is the, the part of through the testimony that the apostles given. Right? And, and the word that we have here in our hands. Uh, go with me to John 
chapter 12. John chapter 12. Actually, I'm sorry, John 14. We are going to go to John chapter 12, but not yet. John chapter 14, what Jesus says here, John chapter 14, and at, first, and at the beginning of John chapter 14, he's taught, telling his disciples that he's going away, going to prepare a place for them and prepare a place for us. Uh, and look what he says in verse 4, and whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am my life, Father, but by me. If ye have ye should have known my Father also. From henceforth ye know him, him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast Thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else... Believe me for the very work's sake. And so we see, I think, Jesus is again pointing to how he's declaring God the Father, how he's declaring that he's the Son of God by his words, by the words that he's speaking, by the works that he did, by the miracles that he's showing. And then again, like I said, if you go to Romans chapter 1, Jesus is declared to be the Son of God by being the first begotten, by being resurrected from the dead. And again, that's how we believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God is through his words and how God was declared to us is through the words of Jesus Christ. Everyone here that's saved, you believe Jesus' words and, and the miracles and things that he's done through his word that we have testimony of. And so again, no man has seen God the Father at any time, but men have seen God the Son, and God the Son declares God the Father. All right, let's go back to our uh, First John. Go back to First John. First John chapter, or I'm sorry, verse 15, it says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Now, when we look at this, we might say, yeah, you have to confess, you have to believe with all of your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died and that he rose again from the dead. And at first glance, you know, that wouldn't be wrong. You know, that's how we get saved is by believing with all of our heart and confessing our mouth, as it says in, in Romans. But again, going along with the theme of this letter that's written to save people, that it's about fellowship with God, I believe that this is again referring to our fellowship and not confessing God, Jesus Christ as the Son of God for salvation, uh, but confessing him before other men. That when we do that, we're in fellowship with God. We dwell in him and he dwells in us. When we don't do that, we're not. Uh, look, look at a good example of this in the gospel of people who believed but did not confess Jesus Christ. Let's go to the gospel of John again. And this is where I said we're going to be in John chapter 12. John 12. John chapter 12. Verse 42, John 12, 42. It says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me 
seeth him that sent me. That sounds very familiar to what Jesus said in John uh, chapter 14. Look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. But what I want to really focus on is at the beginning there where it talked about how among the chief rulers, many believed on him. It says they believed on him, but they wouldn't confess him uh, because of the Pharisees, because they didn't want to get put out of the synagogue, because they liked the praise of men more than the praise of God. And you see, when we fail to confess Jesus Christ because we love the praise of men more than the praise of God, or because maybe of the fear of men, well then... We're not in fellowship with God at that point. I think of a good illustration uh, would be, let's say you had a, a childhood friend. Okay, maybe you guys were best buddies, right? You guys hung out together all summer, just you and your buddy or whatever. And this friend, when you go off to school, maybe he has some other more popular friends in school. And so he, he's hanging out with his popular friends, and you guys were palling around all summer. And then you go up to hang out with your buddy, and he just kind of gives you the cold shoulder, right? Ignores you because he doesn't want the cool kids to know that he was, he, you guys were friends all summer, right? And, I mean, if, any, if that's ever happened to anybody, I mean, how awful of a feeling uh, must that be, right? How, how low and dirty to treat somebody like that who you would call your friend, who you've done something with, but you, you know, because of shame, you don't, because of, you know, fear of what people will think of you, you deny that person. And you think that's what we do to God. Uh, that's what we do to the name of Jesus Christ when because of fear of what other people might think or how other people might look at us or uh, you know, maybe losing some position or something that we have, we, we wouldn't confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You know, we can't say that we're in fellowship with God at that point. You know, we've just done him wrong. We've treated him bad. Um, and that's what I believe it's talking about there in, in 1 John. Again, it's, it's talking about our fellowship as Christians that when we deny, because there's a lot of people, if you look at that, who will claim that Jesus is the Son of God that don't truly believe that. That doesn't mean that God's dwelling in them. Uh, you know, there's a lot of false religions that they claim. The Jehovah's Witnesses, if you ask them, they'll say, oh, yeah, we believe Jesus is the Son of God. But does God dwell in them? Absolutely not, because they don't believe, really, that he is the Son of God. They may say it, they may confess it out of their mouth, but that's not what they believe. You know, that's why I believe this is talking about confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God before men, or testimony of Jesus Christ uh, before others. All right, let's go back to 1 John. And it's kind of a good segue into the next point, too, because a lot of times we would not confess Jesus Christ uh, before others as a Christian because of fear. And we're going to learn here that, you know, if we are living in that kind of fear, that we are, are, the love of God is not perfected in us. Uh, let's continue reading verse 16. It says, And we have known and believed that the love of God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love, or dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God, and God in him. Here is our love made perfect, that may, we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And I kind of want to spend the rest of my time kind of talking about this in verse 18. That there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. This is, again, another mark, another thing that we, we can know if we're fellowshipping in God, if, we're, uh, if we have true love or not. That perfect love, the love that comes from God, has no fear. 
If we have fear, we're not made perfect in love, as this, as this verse said. And so again, this is another check mark that we can add off as if we're fellowshipping with God, if we're walking in the love of God, do we have fear or not? Now, before we go any further, you're thinking, well, you know, everybody has fear. And so we have to understand that there's, there's two types of fear. There is a good fear and there's a bad fear, right? Uh, uh, there's some fears that are good fears to have. The fear of the Lord, on, for instance, is a good fear to have. You know, in Proverbs 1, 7, it says the beginning of no the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, the, our knowledge begins with the fear of the Lord. And we were talking earlier before we came in here that many people are saved by fear. You know, and, and others saved by fear, pulling them out of the fire, even hating the garment spotted with the flesh. I can tell you, I believe actually most people are probably saved by fear. Uh, I remember when I got saved as a child, I was saved by fear. You know, I was preached the gospel from the time I can remember uh, as, a, as a baby. And so I knew very well by the time I was six years old uh, that the, I had, there was consequences to the sins that I committed. And I can remember having nightmares, waking up in sweats about going to hell. And, and I feared that. I feared God. I feared the consequences of the sins that I knew that I was committing. And I wanted to be saved. I got saved by fear. I think a lot of people get saved by fear. You know, I, I just watching people and just seeing how they respond to scriptures when you witness to them, it's, to me, from the way I view it, it seems most people respond most to and get convicted the most when you're going over those verses about uh, the second death and about hell and about the lake of fire. You know, I, it seems that most people squirm over those verses. Because I believe that's a good fear. You know, the fear of the Lord is a good fear. But you notice in Proverbs, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It doesn't say the fear of the Lord is the middle or the end of knowledge. You see, because I believe as we mature as Christians and as we grow closer uh, to God and closer to the image of Jesus Christ uh, who saved us and as we talked about made us new, that we no longer do the things that we do for God out of fear that that should move to doing things to God out of love. Uh, if you think about uh, the child and son relationship, like my mother and father, there was some things uh, growing up that I would obey their rules, I obey the things that they gave me simply out of fear <laughs> because I knew there was consequences for those things. That if I uh, did something wrong or I didn't obey the things that they said, I was going to get a spanking. But, you know, as I grew and as I matured, now as an adult, I, I don't have that same kind of fear out of my parents, you know. I don't do the things my parents want me to or uh, honor my mother and my father out of fear that I'm going to get a spanking. Because I'm not. Uh, no, I more do what I do for them out of love. You know, and I think, again, that's something, I'm not saying that we should, uh, there's a point in our life where we're going to abandon the fear of the Lord. What I'm saying is, is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If we go through our whole Christian life and the only reason that we do anything for God is just simply out of fear, uh, then we're, we haven't grown. We haven't developed in our relationship with the Lord. Uh, it should move from not just simply doing things or, uh, that we do for the Lord out of fear, uh, but out of the love of God uh, because he loved us first. So there is a good kind of fear. The fear of the Lord is a good kind of fear. Uh, you know, God, I believe, puts natural fears in us uh, to help protect us, right? You know, the, the fear of extreme heights is, is not a bad fear, right? It helps to keep us uh, from killing ourselves. Uh, the fear of things that can immediately threaten our lives or kill us is not necessarily a, a bad fear, so going into this tonight, I don't want you to believe that, oh, we've got to leave here all being macho, man, that we're not perfected in love if we have any kind of fear in us whatsoever. You know, anybody that would say that they don't have any fears is a liar. Everybody fears, you know, something. But there's a good fear and there's a bad fear. The fear of the Lord is a good fear. Some of the natural fears that God has put in us to help preserve our lives are a, a good fear. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are bad fears. Uh, you know, the fear of man, for instance, that would be a bad fear. 
Uh, in Proverbs 29, 25, it says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. You know, fearing other people, as we talked about before, those chief rulers who feared man more than they feared God and they desired the praise of man more than they desired the praise of God, that's a bad fear. That's a bad fear that's going to lead you into a snare. Uh, that's going to pull you away from doing the things that you should that are right and just doing what you do to please men and to be saved. And really, that's one of the ways that we can know that we, it's a bad fear. You know, if the fear that we have keeps us from doing something that God has commanded us to do, or if the fear that we have, uh, you know, keeps us from doing right, uh, that's a bad fear. You know, there's no amount of fear that should make us not do what God has told us to do. You know, not assembling uh, for fear of the coronavirus is a bad fear. You know, Jesus, we are told in Scripture not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You know, you may have that fear, but it's not a good fear if it pulls you away from a commandment that God has clearly given to you. You know, in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. See, thou therefore be not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be uh, partakers of the afflictions of the gospel, the Apostle Paul said. You know, uh, even if we're to the point of being persecuted for what we believe about Jesus Christ, God didn't give us that spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of power and of love, and we're not made perfect in love if we have fear. That's one way we know we're not walking in the spirit, is if we have a fear that's keeping us from doing what we should do, keeping the commandments of God, doing the things that God has told, told us to do. You know, a fear of man, uh, it, can, it exposes actually our lack of love uh, uh, towards God and towards others. You know, a fear of man, we may not think about it that way, but in light of the scripture that we have, uh, fearing man actually shows that we really don't have love for them and that we really don't have love for God. You know, when we fear other, we fear man, we, uh, we really just show in a love for nobody else but ourselves. That's, that's what we're showing. We, that we have no other love for anybody else other than ourselves when we fear man to the point that we're not going to do what God wants us to do or we're not going to do something that may be good for that person. A good example would be, you know, just using fear as an excuse not to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You know, that's a bad fear. Uh, and we all have those fears, we all have those anxieties, but if it keeps us from doing the things that God has told us to do, uh, well, then we're not being controlled by God anymore at that point. Our love is not perfected. Uh, our, the love for God and our love for our fellow man is not propelling us past that fear to do the things that we should do. Uh, we're giving into that fear. We don't love God at that point. We're not loving that person at that point. We're loving ourselves. We're just loving our own personal comfort. And we're putting our own personal comfort above everybody else. You know, not just about being nervous of witnessing, being nervous, uh, maybe preaching the word of God uh, is an example, a personal example. I could tell you at the beginning when I first started preaching, you know, at Bible Baptist Church and things, a lot of the times I was, man, I, the first messages I preached, I was just scared to death. Uh, Maggie could tell you some of the first messages, the whole first, like, 15, 20 minutes of my preaching, I was so scared that my mouth, whenever I got nervous, would dry out. And it would dry out so bad, my lips and stuff would start sticking to, like, my teeth. <laughs> like I had sandpaper in my mouth. And, you know, as I look back on that, it's because, really, when I was preaching those first times, uh, I was most nervous because I cared about what people thought about me is I was worrying about how I was going to be perceived and if people thought I was doing a good job. And I didn't really care about the people I was preaching to as much as I cared about how I was doing. And uh, naturally, of course, anytime you try something new, and I think they say public speaking is like the thing that people are most afraid of, like number one on the list. Above anything else that could kill you or whatever, people are afraid of public speaking. And again, it, it, 
I'm not knocking people to anybody that gets nervous when they preach or when they publicly speak, uh, especially in your first time. But if it's to the point where you just, you, you, like as you're speaking, you can never get over that or you never get over that the more you do it or, you know, that keeps you from actually doing it uh, when maybe you're supposed to, uh, then that's, that's a bad fear, right? That fear has, your love is not perfect. Uh, that fear is exposing the fact that you're, you're not motivated by God, you're not motivated by love. And, and again, this will help us because I've had those times, and maybe you have, where you know that you're, you're being filled by the Holy Spirit, moved by the Spirit of God, and you know in those times, you're bold, you, you, you're willing to say what needs to be said. You're not worried about what people think about you. You just don't, you don't care because you're, you're not motivated by uh, yourself. Uh, you're being propelled by the Spirit of God. And this God is love. And so in him is our love perfected. And there is no fear. Perfect love casteth out fear, it says. You know, but like I said, a lot of people use fear. They'll use a fear as an excuse, you know, not to witness to others, not to do the things that they're supposed to for God. How many, how many of you ever heard, well, I just don't want to force what I believe on other people. You know, I, I believe what I believe and, you know, I believe that's personal of me and then I don't want to force that upon other people. And again, that's just an excuse. Again, that's just a, a lame excuse as to why you won't witness to somebody because if you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven, if you know how to tell somebody how they can have eternal life and you're just not willing to share because I don't want to force my beliefs on people, well, you don't love that person. You hate that person, okay? You love yourself. Uh, let's stop using the world's jargon. I don't want to force my beliefs on other people. Let's just call it what it is. If you're not willing to share the way of eternal life with somebody who you know is going to die and go to hell, you don't love that person. You hate that person. Because how hateful would it have to be to stand by and just watch somebody go to hell and you can tell them how to get saved and you don't. That's a bad fear. And you're just masking your fear behind some worldly philosophy. That's all it is. And your love is not perfect. Uh, you don't love that person. Perfect love casteth out fear. You know, if there's someone maybe... I mean, you know, maybe we encounter people in life. Maybe there's people that we're genuinely afraid of or intimidated by. You know, perfect love casteth out fear. We'll work on loving that person, and you might not be afraid of that person. You know, for example, I have some clients that are, uh, sometimes I go to, they can be intimidating. You can tell that they're just going to be a jerk about everything, and, you know, they're, uh, they're just going to make it hard for you. And, you know, I personally want to, pray to God that I have opportunity to witness to every person and when those opportunities arise that I will, I, I will give testimony, that I won't be ashamed to confess Jesus Christ. And it seems like all the people that are the most hard and rigid and uh, mean, that there, there always comes a time where I confess, can confess Jesus Christ before them. Something will always open up in conversation or whatnot and you know, if I really love that person I won't be controlled by my fear and I'll say something. But, you know, if there's people that we are maybe intimidated by or are afraid of, you know, the way that we can have love for them is uh, by doing what Jesus told us to. You know, uh, maybe we should pray for them. Uh, maybe we should do good for them. Maybe we should bless them. Right? He said, love your enemies. He said, he said to do good or uh, bless them that curse you. Uh, do good for them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. If you want to work on loving somebody, you serve them. And we see that over and over again in the Bible. Jesus, when he was talking to the uh, apostle Peter after he had risen uh, from the dead and he was sitting there at the end of uh, John uh, and Peter had denied Jesus three times. Well, the same number of times Jesus asked uh, Peter a question. Do you love me? And, and Peter said, yeah, you, you know I love you. And what did he say after? He said, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. You see, every time after he asked him that question and Peter told him he loved him, then God told him, 
a way he can serve him. He said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Right? Because if we love, we'll serve. You know, if you're afraid, you're intimidated by somebody, you, uh, you don't know how to love them, serve them. Serve them. Pray for them. Do good for them. Bless them. Uh, you'll find that as you serve people, you'll love them more. You'll love them more. It sounds backwards. I can see some, I mean, Chris is rolling his eyes like, what is he talking about? I'm just kidding. I'm just pointing out, just, just joking. Uh, but no, yeah, yeah. It, it, but it works. It really does. And, you know, that's where faith, again, kicks in. Because the wisdom of man would tell us, hey, if you want to, if somebody you're afraid of, you don't like, you know, serving them is not going to help you love them better, right? They, they should serve you, and then you'll love them better. But no, it's the opposite. Jesus, throughout the Bible, is teaching us the opposite, that we should serve others. If you're intimidated, you're afraid of somebody, you uh, maybe somebody, your enemy, you're having a hard time loving them, serve them. And that will help you to love them, because that's what Jesus did. He came as a servant. Uh, he loved us first, remember? We didn't love him. Uh, he came to us first, people who hated him. And what did he do? He came as a servant, as a minister. And he loved us first. We loved him. You know, perfect love casteth out fear. And you know, love, when we have love, we have this perfect love. It, like we said, it leads us to, to boldness, you know. Uh, you, people use that expression, love is bold, you know. And a, another way that we love is telling the truth. You know, love tells the truth. Uh, fear lies. You know, remember, Satan is a liar and the father of it. So when you're afraid, you don't tell the truth. You lie instead. You know, again, for our own personal comfort, sometimes we won't tell th people things, the hard things that they need to hear that might be the truth because we don't love them. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians that we're supposed to speak the truth in love. I mean, grow up into him, which is the head, even Christ. That doesn't mean we have to be jerks about it. That doesn't mean when you speak the truth, you're just supposed to give it to them hard and fast and just, uh, you know, just lay it on them. You know, we ought to speak the truth in love. We ought to be, there's a way to speak that we, in meekness, we're, we're supposed to instruct those that, impose, that oppose themselves. Right? But true love speaks the truth. Uh, you know, our love is... Perfect love casteth out fear, and love speaks the truth. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, which is the love chapter, it says uh, about love that love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but in the truth. You know, love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but in the truth. Going along to get along is not love. You know, a lot of people will withhold the truth just for the sake of keeping peace, right? And they'll say it's, you know, it's more loving just to... To go along, to get along. But you know what? Love doesn't do that. Love rejoices in the truth. It despises iniquity. You know, and if we want to be perfect in love, we shouldn't be afraid to tell the truth. You know, God is the truth. Uh, let's go back to 1 John and we'll wrap up. In 1 John, I just want to look at one more thing. As we continue on in verse 19, it says, We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. See what it says there in verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. You know, our love for others is actually just a byproduct of God's love for us. Don't you just let that sink in. Our love for others is really just a byproduct of God's love for us. You know, God loves us first. We didn't love him first. He loved us first. So we're having a hard time loving other people. Then we need to get our focus back on the love that God has towards us. And we see the order. God loved us. We focus on the love that God has for us. We love him. We love God. You know, God is love. We will love other people. 
You know, whenever you count yourself maybe having a hard time loving people, you see all the wickedness in the world, you have a hard time just getting your heart warm uh, towards being a witness and towards helping other people and doing good for those that might hate you, then we need to get our focus back towards God who loved us first. And when we focus on the love that he has for us first, we'll love him and we'll love others. Our love is a byproduct of God loving us first. You know, it's a tr kind of like a trickle-down effect, you could say. <laughs> you know, his, his love to us reflects back, and then it, it, it can branch out to other people. And he, we love God because he loved us first. And so, again, uh, you know, if we're, this is another way we can check to see if we truly have the love of God in us, if we're in fellowship with God because God is love. If we're not loving, if there's fear that's keeping us from loving, keeping us from doing the things of God, well, then we're not in that fellowship because God is love. We will love too. Uh, let's bow our heads in prayer.